Uh, greetings, dear church. It's so wonderful to see everybody here today again. The Lord is truly le leading today's service, I believe. And he wants to say something to us because it's not very often when the morning service and the evening service, the topics align so much. And today, as we go on in our service, I believe we'll see how the Lord is orchestrating everything together and leading even the same topics, the same verses that we will be reading and studying once again. And when we look at them from different angles, we always get something new that we can glean from. There was once a husband who had a wife who was always worried about things. She was a warrior. She always worried about getting things the right way, looking in the future, trying to avoid things. And her husband got really upset with her and said, finally, why do you always worry when it doesn't do you any good? And quickly the wife replied, yes, it does do good, because 90% of the things I worry about never come to, to happen. So from the wife's perspective, she thinks, because I worry about them so much, these things never happen. But we know from God's perspective, when we worry about something, we oftentimes, we think that we, we, we think that we are in charge, but we need to trust the Lord because he's the one who can control everything. So today, the topic of my sermon is how God's peace guards us from anxiety. And we're going through Philippians, just as in the morning we heard the two brothers were preaching from the same chapter, and we'll be reading the same verses actually today. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. We're going in order, and we'll see how this all ties into the earlier verses and how important it is to look at the Word of God in context. So we'll read chapter 4, verses, five, verses 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And, by, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What a wonderful two verses we read here today. And the, the earlier, the bro, uh, Brother Gregory talked about the joy that is supposed to be in every Christian. And rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. And right after those verses, he talks about how we should not worry about the things that are out of our control. And especially now in the time when so, there's so much uncertainty, it's hard to not worry and I admit that I'm the first one that will be the one that says I worry. But oftentimes our worry, we worry about things. If we worry about things that are out of our control, that's when God says we should not do that because those things may never even happen because we see that God takes care of us because he loves us as dear children. Somebody once said that if you, if you live a life, uh, if you don't live with an anchor of faith, you will drift on the sea of anxiety. So if our anchor is faith, then we will, uh, we will not be anxious. We will do things that please the Lord and we'll serve him. And today, the, I would like to answer this, this question, how God's peace guards us from anxiety. And we'll look at how these verses tie into this, the topic of peace and how it ties in with not worrying about things that are out of our control. So the first point I would look at with you is, what does it mean not to be anxious? And the, let's look at verse five, uh, verse six again. Be, the first part, be anxious for nothing. So here we see that this is a command. It is not just um, some kind of good request or some kind of desire of his. This is a command. He says, do not be anxious or do not worry. Nizabotis, how it says in Russian. We see that Apostle Paul says, do not be anxious, and he's saying this is a very big problem. This is a problem that the church had in Philippi, even though he doesn't correct them very often, but he says, do not be anxious, do not think about what will happen in the future, but live in the present time. Now, we do have to worry about some things, like we, when we worry about our children growing up in this world, that's a good worry, because we worry that they will grow up as godly children, so we plant the seed of the word of God in them, and that is a good, good thing to worry about. But I think when he says do not worry, he means don't worry about things that are out of our control, and don't, uh, don't cause these things to uh, negatively affect us 
in different ways. And we will see how when Jesus talked in the Sermon on the Mount, he says how negatively uh, the worrying can affect us. So let's look at what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25. We're actually just singing about these verses, uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount. But let's, let's read a few verses when Jesus talks about worrying and not worrying because God takes care of even the, the birds that we don't even think about. But how many of you have ever seen a, a bird that is worried because it didn't find the worm or a food in a proper time? The bird just trusts that God will provide for it. So let, let's read a few verses here. Uh, Matthew 6. 25, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or what you drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothing? And if we just skip down to, uh, you could read the whole passage if you want, but we'll skip down to save some time. Verse 31 says again, therefore I say, do not worry um, what you what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what shall we wear. For all of these things the Gentiles seek. And then he says in verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we see that Jesus uses the same word that Apostle Paul used in Philippians, to worry, not to worry. And he also uses the same word when he, he's referring to Martha and Mary. Remember how Martha was gathering a big meal and Mary sat at the feet of Jesus she picked the better part and Jesus says Martha Martha there's so much you're preparing so much but there's only one thing that is needful and Mary chose that one thing and the Greek word that Apostle Paul uses here to describe anxiety or worry that some translations have it is a word that says to be double-minded or to be to have your mind divided when you're, when you're always thinking about different things. And that's what Apostle Paul says, it is unhealthy to, to live such a way because it affects us. And Jesus was just taught, the verses we talked about in Matthew 6, Jesus says that it, it is unhealthy to live in, with constant worry because it affects our health. And we know there's examples in the Old Testament where there's kings that were so worried that they couldn't even sleep or eat for example, King Darius, when he found out about uh, Daniel that he would be executed, he was, uh, or he would be thrown to the, the lions. He was, he could not eat or sleep, and that is oftentimes how anxiety is expressed. And if it is continued in a long time, it will definitely affect us neg- negatively. And it is also unfitting for a child of God to, to have anxiety because, in a sense, that is showing that you are not completely trusting God. God as a good father who will take care of you. And also it is unproductive, just as Jesus says, who can add to your stature, who can make yourself taller, who can change their hair color by worrying about it. We also see that in Proverbs, Solomon writes about anxiety also. He says, Proverbs 12, 25 the great man that had everything he ever wanted, but he sa- says this about anxiety. He says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. And I think Apostle Paul, when he was writing about joy and then at the same time anxiety, he probably had in mind this proverb that we, we heard in the morning about rejoicing and about our face should express this joy of that that is not always even... Uh, it's not always visible, but it should be inside our hearts, the joy that the Lord gives us. When we trust the Lord completely, that is when we can be free from anxiety. And also we see that it, uh, what does it mean to not have anxiety is when we have the strength of the Lord. Uh, remember, Isaiah writes about the do not fear. He uses the word, uh, the prophet Isaiah writes, do not fear over and over in his long, long uh, prophecy. But if we look at Isaiah 41.10, we, we see how the prophet says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not, uh, do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He says, Do not anxiously look about 
uh, things that are out of your control. Let God control those things. So what does it mean not to be anxious? Is when we completely trust the Lord with uh, the things that are out of our control. And secondly, how we should approach God in prayer. So in the next part of this verse talks about prayer. And we heard about this in the morning. But we'll look a little bit about prayer and how important it is to uh, combat anxiety. So how we should approach God in prayer is, first of all, we should approach him in humility. And, and when we see how Apostle Paul writes here, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in your let your request be made known to God. So he uses the word here in the beginning, in everything. So there is no request that is too small. There's nothing that we should think that, oh, this is just a minor little, uh, maybe I'm going to run an errand to the grocery store for five minutes. I don't need to pray about that. No, God says everything. Let everything be uh, under God's control. Let God control everything in our lives because we in, as this in humility. So the word uh, supplication is actually the word that is, uh, when we think about somebody, ask, the, the definition is a, a humble request from somebody in authority, a, a humble request to, to help, for help from somebody in authority. So we know that God is the ultimate authority. So when we come to him, we humbly ask. We do not re, uh, command God. We do not force God to give us something that uh, we want, we humbly request. And this is a, a, a good example, I think, of this. Is, if we remember the, the man who owed 10,000 talents, and then the, there's a, the same man had somebody else who owed him just uh, 100 denarii. So we see, what could this man do that owed 10,000 talents? All he could do is su have supplication or uh, bow down, plead for his life and say, I will pay you back in whatever way, maybe just a tiny little portion of that debt. He said, I'll, I'll, be, I'll do anything you want. So he begged, he pleaded, and the king, uh, he, gave, he granted him that request. And we know that after it changed, uh, the king was really angry at him because he did not forgive the one that had just a hundred denarii. But we see that the man, he was pleading, he was begging, and the other man was also pleading and begging him to forgive that small debt, but he didn't. So this is the word that Apostle Paul uses here to, for supplication. So when we are asking God for something, we are basically casting our cares on the Lord. So if we look at 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter uses, a, a, there's a verse there that we see how Peter says just throw on or cast. That means like when you cast out a line, a fishing line. It says uh, casting all your care, anxieties on him because he cares for you. Or все заботы ваши возложите на него, ибо он печется о вас. Заботы or переживания. Or we see how this uh, anxiety, this uh, worry that oftentimes causes us to, to hold this to ourselves. But God actually says to Give those, desire, uh, give those uh, worries to him because he will take care of you. So our prayers should also have a heart of thanksgiving, and that's what we see in the next part of this verse. But in everything with thanksgiving. So we often we teach our kids to be thankful, but it is definitely not something that comes naturally because oftentimes kids want to take and not even say thank you. But when we, when we instill this thank, thankfulness, even to somebody uh, just giving them maybe candy, we say, th say thank you, and that teaches them that everything they get is they should be thankful, and this is the, re the heart we should have towards God when we see everything we have is uh, a gift from him, and we should be thankful with thanksgiving, that because now things seem to be, we still live in a time of prosperity, even though there's so much uncertainty, but when things get a little difficult, when there's a lot of people lost their jobs in this last four or five months, are we still thankful for the Lord because we still have our life, we're still alive, there's no war in our country, we can still be so thankful for so much different things in our life. And Apostle Paul uses a similar phrase in Thessalonians, he remember the part where he says, rejoice always, 
Pray without ceasing in everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So also we should make our request uh, known to God and let him decide how he will answer our prayers. Oftentimes we want an answer from God that we think is best for us, but when we trust God that he has the best answer, we know that he will always answer in a way that is uh, best for us. Maybe not in the, maybe for us we think it's better for him to answer this way, but when we look in the long, long run of our whole life, of our eternity, then we know that God will always answer in the way that's best for him, for us to glorify him in our lives. When we look at Matthew 7, 11, that's also part of the Sermon on the Mount, we see that Jesus says, Matthew 7, 11, he says, If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask of him? God always wants to give us good and he wants to bless us. And we, even though our, the blessings are sometimes not visible, sometimes they come in the form of weeping because somebody we might have lost somebody, but we know that God works out things for the better for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And let's look at the last point of my sermon to, to, today with you. Number three is how God's peace will guard our hearts and mind. How God's peace will guard our hearts and minds. And actually, we will hear a little more about this topic of peace in the next sermon so that God is really um, leading us to something, to have the peace of God. Because uh, oftentimes we lose this peace when we start to worry about things that are in the, uh, when we look at the future. But look at verse 7 again. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He will guard our hearts. And this peace is beyond our understanding. It's something that we cannot even express in words. It's something that is um, beyond what we can even think about. So the peace of God will protect our hearts from feeling discouraged and afraid. And when we trust God, he will always uh, keep us from fear because we know that perfect love casts out fear. But if we look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, this is a verse that talks about the peace of Christ. And it says here, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. How do we do that? We let, we let God control us, and we do not, when we try not to uh, hold on to the life and have God lead our life the way we think is best, but when we trust the Lord that he will lead us according to his purposes. So God's peace will keep our minds focused on Christ and on serving him. And if God, will, God wills, next time we will look at verse 8. That's the verse that actually we spend a much part of the time in the morning. The brother was talking about how important it is to fill, fill our mind with, with things that are so uh, precious and dear to us. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is, things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And God willing, we'll talk a little more about this. And we heard about how important it is to fill our minds with these kind of characteristics in our lives. And that's the kind of things that will cast out fear. And that's the kind of things that will uh, cast out anxiety from our hearts when we, when we trust perfectly in the Lord. We also see that Isaiah writes... In chapter 26, verse 3, he says, You will keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You will keep in perfect peace who are set, whose minds are set on God. So if we think, we're thinking about God, he will bless us, he will keep us from this anxiety that is all over us in the world. And the last thing before we pray is uh, a look at how peace is oftentimes expressed in our in our lives, and we, we know that Apostle Paul writes a, a lot about the peace of Christ. 
And we know that the peace of Christ always starts from a vertical relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And then when we have that proper relationship, then we have a right horizontal relationship through those people around us. And the last verse I would like to read, or a few verses, is recorded in Ephesians chapter 2. And with these uh, verses, we could meditate and pray together that the Lord will help us have this kind of peace in our hearts. So Ephesians chapter 2, 14 for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the en enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in, uh, in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from, the, from two, thus, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he may come and, pre uh, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar and those who were near. So here, Apostle Paul talks about the peace that comes first from ha having that close relationship with Jesus Christ, and then that peace will overflow to those who are far and those who are near. So there's a lot more that we can talk about. I think as we go into verse 8, we'll see how this all ties in. The next few verses are very important in understanding this whole passage. But today the Lord gave us a chance just to look at these two verses where he talks about not to be anxious, where he talks about uh, opening our prayers and uh, our desires before the Lord, always being thankful, and that the peace that God gives us will guard our minds from all the evils in this world. And in these times of uncertainty, we can remember that God is the source of our peace, and it is God himself who is our peace and who will help us overcome all the anxiety. And right now we have a chance to pray, bow down together, and let, let us lift up our voice to the Lord. Uh, amen. Let's pray.